Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. It's, uh, I think a few uh, months ago when I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Rasuli, she asked me to uh, be a keynote for this program, and I said, what, what kind of a topic I can pick for a group that, is, uh, that has so much energy, so much uh, intellectual uh, uh, you know, wealth. And I thought what the most uh, relevant topic would be talking about the, the pace of change, how change is really happening, and the kind of environment that all of us are part of. So that basically is how I picked up the topic of uh, uh, being at an age of uh, inflection and what does that mean for all of us. At San Jose State, one of the comments that I make to all of our students is that you know, in the past, we used to tell students, why don't you get a, uh, get a college degree so you can land your ideal job? And today, we tell them, get a college degree so you can invent your ideal job. And that basically is where I think the whole spirit of entrepreneurship comes and why I think that's it's so important. Uh, because I think it's individuals like each and every one of you that really changes the world. And it's individuals like each and every one of you who are trailblazers and really inventing the future for all of us. So within that, I think as we look at how things are really changing and how the future is, uh, is really, you know, the change really happens, I think we have traditionally seen changes in a number of ways. The, the first way that we have seen change, or, or intellectually we look at it, is the linear changes. And linear changes, are, you know, uh, that's, that looks something as very natural. You know, things, you know, for instance, you, you drive from here to Los Angeles, it takes five hours. After the first hour, you've done 20% of the distance, two hours, 40%, uh, so on and so forth. And uh, also, we look at some organizations, some areas where those changes may look even, uh, you, you know, the changes that we see in organizations might be relatively small. All, let, let me give you one of the examples. If you look at uh, sprint uh, runners, and the changes that we see are quite minimal. Uh, the 100 meter, uh, 100 meter uh, uh, record holder back in 1912, it was 10.6 uh, 10 seconds. By, uh, by the 1964, it dropped to about 10.06 seconds. And in 2009, it dropped to 9.58. So over a course of close to 100 years, it only changed by about 6%. I think some of us may relate to uh, organizations that we have been which the rate of change looks that slow. Uh, but I think as we look at the technology and the kind of changes that we see, we see uh, traditionally we have looked at an S-curve change in most organizations. And this is uh, the model that uh, uh, Carlotta Perez, one of the major uh, uh, economists, looked at uh, this particular model. And her view was that changes that organizations have are not just technological. It, a lot of that has to do with the, so, uh, the uh, sociological changes that that world really sees. And that's why it takes a while whenever we have a new technology. We see a major new technology. Then a lot of changes happen within that. And we see that technology flatten off. And then we see a new technology develop. And that basically is how we look at major changes, whether, whether we look at the internal combustion engine, whether we look at, uh, for instance, the uh, electricity, telephones, many other uh, changes that we have seen in the last uh, several centuries, those are the paths that, we are, uh, that traditionally we have seen. But I think as we look at the kind of changes that we have today, the uh, changes are much, much faster than what uh, you know, these two models tell us. And basically, I think the kind of changes that we see are more uh, exponential. I think many of us have you've heard of the comment that you know, how uh, tall it will be if you take a piece of paper and fold it 10 times, 20 times, 30, 40, 100 times. The natural tendency is to think, well, that will mean maybe a few inches or a, you know, maybe at most a feet or so. But in reality, is uh, when you fold a piece of paper 30 times, it's uh, the distance between here and the moon, 40 times the distance between here and the sun. And if you do fold it 100 times, it's going to be higher than the distance between uh, you know, several billion light years, which is more than the known uh, uh, edge of the universe. Uh, so I think that and the reason for that is because uh, as, uh, as far as human beings are concerned, intuitively, we cannot relate with exponential change. We look at things intuitively more in a 
in a linear way. But I'll, I think a lot of the changes that we have today that are happening are mostly in an exponential way. And that's, and I would like to give you exa a few examples of it. And I think all of you as entrepreneurs and um, innovators, that basically is where you see most of the opportunities as we look towards the future. Let me first uh, give an example of what's really happening in terms of the financial world. Traditionally, people have looked at the financial world as the Pareto chart. Alfredo Pareto was, uh, uh, was a, an Italian economist, and this is where he developed the role of the 80-20, that he realized that traditionally, 80% of the world's wealth was concentrated in the hands of about 20%, and he uh, took that concept and expanded that one to other parts of the society, and of course, we've heard that one in every organization. It's the 20% who does 80% of the work, or the 20% who has all of the ingenuity of the, other, uh, of the 80%, so on and so forth. And that basically is what has really been looked at on the financial world. But if you look at what has happened in the US and globally in the last uh, decade or so, we see a stratification of the wealth. You know, for instance, in the last 30 years, uh, if you look at it from the 19, uh, from the 1980s, uh, 1983 to 2009, over 100% of the wealth creation in the US was concentrated on the top 20%. Well, how could it be more than 100%? Well, basically that means that those who are uh, in the middle class actually lost ground from 1983 to 2009. In fact, if you look at it in that timeline, over, as I said, over 80% uh, of that increase was in that uh, 20% uh, uh, you know, of the population. But if you look at it, out of that on the top 5%, actually account for about 80% of the increase, and the top 1% account for about 40% of the increase. So traditionally in the economic cycles, when we talked about, well, when you have the a rising tide raises all of the boats, today's environment, the rising tide only raises yachts and not all of the boats, and the boats stay where they are. And that, I think, really has a deep uh, sociological implication, societal implication, as we look towards the future. I think the other uh, area that I want to look at is uh, when we look at uh, uh, cities, the urbanization factor has been another element where we see similar um, exponential shifts, for instance. If you look at in the US, the top 100 cities in the US has one eighth of the land mass, but over two thirds of the population base, over three quarters of the economy. And of course, over 95% of the traffic, as all of us have can painfully uh, uh, you know, uh, attest to that. But that basically is where a lot of that the energy and economic vitality is happening. But if you look at it globally, I think we see even far bigger changes, actually. In fact, uh, based on some of the McKinsey reports, between uh, now and uh, 2025, the top one, uh, 400 cities in the world are going to have over 2 billion in population, but more than 66% of the gross domestic product and uh, that base, and so we're adding over two billion people, mostly in the emerging economies, that are going to be very insatiable uh, you know, consumers of the world. And that's basically the kind of environment that we see in the future. And that, and I think specifically when we talk about for all of the entrepreneurs and all of the uh, innovators, that's really the, the bigger market rather than just the U.S. or the de developing countries. If you just look at China, for instance. Uh, China between now and 2025, uh, there are, uh, by 2025, China will have over 220 cities that will be at the size of Chicago and bigger. That, that's only in China. And if you look at all of the, uh, the other uh, remaining 200 cities, uh, usually they are in the, in the emerging markets. Uh, 2009 was the first year that after 200 years, that the, uh, the increase in more than half of the economic growth in the world was in the emerging economies. And uh, when we look at the next uh, several decades, I think that's where we see uh, most, uh, most of that growth. And that really, I think, is a major shift in terms of uh, where the world is really uh, going. And those are the kind of changes that we need to be cognizant of, as well as the great opportunities that uh, uh, new uh, cities and urban areas are really providing. Of course, the other element is that when we look at technology, something that each and every one of you are far more 
knowledgeable about it than I, you know, could start with and uh, 3D printing, uh, 3D printing, how it's really uh, changing manufacturing. You know, the, the fact that uh, we can, build, uh, we can uh, print many uh, human body parts now and uh, they're developing elements on the uh, uh, internal organs and all of its functionality. But, in, uh, but the changes that it's bringing in, in uh, uh, manufacturing is the fact that in some cases you could reduce the cost of manufacturing by over 95%. And the particular algorithms that we that could be developed there, how it's really transforming trans, uh, manufacturing in a very new way, and that's uh, I think gonna, is going to create so many new opportunities uh, when we look at uh, each and every field. Uh, the other aspect of uh, you know even uh, 3D printing, this is uh, by a report by uh, Airbus. They are expecting that by 2050 they'll be able to print commercial airliners using 3D printing. So I think that kind of gives us a sense of the kind of changes that we're really seeing. And as part of these kind of changes that I think Ray Kurzweil law of uh, accelerating return really takes life. And, and uh, law of accelerating return really states that when, you, when the order ex increases exponentially, the time, limit, uh, the time difference between two key events becomes shorter and shorter. And that basically is, I think, the the crux of that exponential uh, changes that we really look at. According to uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, when we look at the changes that we're gonna have in this century, it's gonna be equivalent of what human beings have experienced for the last 20,000 years. So if you really break that one into a number of uh, you know, uh, smaller cycles, Basically, in a in a one generation, the change that the world is going to see is equivalent of the changes that we have seen from the uh, Egyptian Middle Kingdom to today. And really, I think if we really uh, uh, think about that, when that gives us a key key element about the the pace of change and the kind of changes that we are going to see today, and as we look out to the future as well. So I uh, talked a little bit about the, uh, about the manufacturing, and I think the other part in terms of globalization, something that uh, each and every one of you are quite familiar with. I, you know, the chain, uh, basically, we are seeing the whole world to become our new manufacturing site. And I thought the easiest way that I can uh, show that when I'm given an ana analogy is looking at the orchestra. Traditionally, we've looked at orchestra in a chamber in an area where you're playing in a hall. But in reality, when you look at manufacturing, what really is happening is that this is basically our orchestra of today, where you could have different instruments are played at different parts of the world. And these instruments are, uh, you know, as, part, as different parts of the world, they're all playing at the same time synchronously without any issue. And uh, those are the kind of environments that I think we are seeing that, uh, despite the fact that different parts are all over the world, the world, uh, the orchestra still sounds uh, as one entity. Many of you may uh, read about the first major manufacturing that really used, uh, it was done globally, that was uh, Boeing's uh, 777 airplanes that was built over a span of 18 different time zones. And of course, that's back, that's still an old story because it, uh, 777s were made in the mid 90s. Uh, now, Every manufacturing that is happening in, in anything that we talked about, it's really basically using uh, material from all over the world. And I think that's, that's one the crux of the opportunity that, that is provided, as well as the, some of the challenges and how we have to look at things very systemically and look at aspects of the, not only space, time, and uh, transformational that uh, all of these aspects are really bringing for us. Which really brings us that all, so if we look at all of the key technologies that we have, whether it's from the uh, big data, whether it's uh, social computing, cloud, all of these ones, the combination of all of these technologies and how the, all of these technologies are coming together, that really is uh, the opportunities that it's really provide us on how things are really moving to the future and what are the kind of things that we can really uh, benefit from it in the future. And to really bring about, uh, you know, to use an analogy of uh, how the coming of these technologies really has moved us to a different uh, environment, I wanted to use the, the analogy that 
many of you, uh, the story that I think 99% uh, of you would have uh, had heard, and that was the story of uh, the development of chess, that when chess was developed by uh, whomever developed it, came to that Persian uh, emperor that said, well, you know, uh, look at this game, and he, the emperor was very much pleased, and uh, he asked, well, whatever you want, I, should, I would like to reward you with whatever you like. And that uh, inventor said, well, just give me one grain of rice on the first one and then double that one to the end. Of course, the, per the emperor, not knowing the exponential, uh, the exponential laws, he, was uh, he thought, well, this is such a modest element until he really realized that that's, that's more than all of the grains that uh, is available in the world. But I think if you look at technologies, what uh, we, can, we can see, if you look at many of the technologies, especially in the IT area in the last 30 to 40 years, it has been, you know, we have seen changes. It has been more like we see ourselves in the first half of a chess table. You know, if you start the first uh, half of a chess table from one grain to double, triple, uh, double, quadruple, and then six, uh, 68 times, 16 times, whatever, you get to about, I scared myself. Uh, you get to about four uh, billion grains. So that's still doable. I mean, even an emperor can get, you know, it will be several tons or so. But the, the fact that these technologies have come together, in a way, we are in the second half of that chess uh, table. In that second half, that's where these numbers increase from 4 billion to, uh, to 16 billion, uh, 256, and so on. And that's where I think the impacts of technologies that we see are going to be so much greater and so much bigger than what we have seen in the in the past. And I think as part of it, one of, uh, in the universities, the elements that we need to look at is what does it mean to talk about somebody who's educated regardless of one particular field? How could they really be uh, career ready and how they could really uh, be successful in the future? Traditionally, one of the models that, uh, this was a model that was developed by, by the IBM, and their view was that we want to make sure that everyone has to be more like a T-shaped person. The T-shaped person was, well, you want to make sure that the person has that deep and narrow technical knowledge in a particular field that they have. At the same time, they should have some foundational knowledge uh, that will be broad and shallow. And those foundational areas included such as uh, elements such as communication skills, critical thinking skills, uh, having a civic and, and uh, ethical compass, uh, as well as a global perspective. Those were the kind of skills that uh, people really needed. I believe that in today's environment, the need is far more than that. Uh, we need to look at the technological fluency as one of the, uh, as one of the needs for, for every person. Uh, so these technological fluencies, I think, is going to be so critical whether a person is majoring in English or engineering, biology, or history. And that would really make a big difference on their, not only on their employability, but also how they can really utilize a lot of the skills that they have. Uh, the way that I look at it in a very simplistic way, you know, 30, 40 years ago, anybody who was applying for a job, the first thing that they used to ask uh, that person is, do you have a valid driver's license? And the valid driver's license really meant, can you get from point A to point B, or you know, get to your job in a uh, you know, hopefully a, uh, a reliable way? Today's environment, I think that technological fluency is going to be so critical for every person to be able to be successful in their career and all of the knowledge and know-how they have to be able to use it more successfully. Well, the question is that what are some of those key knowledge bases that we have to look at? I think, uh, and this is based on some of the research that I've seen as well as the work of the National Science Foundation, and they look at these four key areas as uh, uh, nanotechnology, biotechnology, co uh, cognitive and info technology. So NBIC is really becoming the key elements. As I mentioned earlier, some of the key areas. You know, somehow in every conference that I've been, AB is one of the things that I have most difficulties. It must be me. <laughs> but uh, basically, all of, I think uh, some of the global issues that we had, I'll just go for those ones. We see that uh, the skill sets that every person has will be these, in these three key areas, like the T uh, model that I mentioned, having that narrow and, uh, and uh, uh, narrow technical knowledge, 
overall uh, competency level, professional competency levels, entrepreneurship and whatever, as well as global competency. And I think these are the combinations that we really need to have so we can uh, move to the future. I think that's what kind of brings us in terms of where we need to be and what, what, what are some of the key elements that we see in technology. And I wanted to use this particular example about though, what will happen if those who are not trying to use technology or really look at to the future. This is a comment that was made for G.G. Simpson that about dinosaurs that we don't know what really happened to dinosaurs, but one thing we know is that the world changed and dinosaurs did not. Uh, and, but there was one particular dinosaur, and that is uh, basically birds that were able to make that change. And they, the way that they were able to make that change was looking at a totally different part of a, of a space and using that particular space, that's how they were, uh, they, not only they thrived, they multiplied in very major ways. And that's really made the whole key elements. And I think if you really look at that as an example of the future, that's basically how I think organizations need to transform themselves and change themselves in a very, very major way. The changes that we have today are very similar to uh, the changes that the world went from using Roman numbers to Indian numbers. And that change is the kind of ch technological changes that we have today. But I think as part of all of that one, uh, we have to be cognizant of, uh, of uh, many other factors. And I use a quote from uh, Robert Kennedy, and he said, well, but you have to, you know, uh, but, and then the quote is, the gross national product does not include the beauty of our poetry or the intelligence of our public debate. It measures neither our, neither our wit, neither our courage, neither our wisdom, nor our learning, neither our compassion, nor our devotion. It measures everything, in short, all what really counts. So we have to really look at all other aspects of life. And the other aspect that we need to keep in mind, and that is uh, that whatever we do, we should look at our work as uh, something that is continually, uh, continual uh, improvement, because as uh, Reed Hoffman of uh, LinkedIn stated, in the Silicon Valley, when you say you're finished, you truly are finished. You have to look at yourself as a work in progress at all times. So as part of that one to, to finish, uh, I thought of one form of Hafiz, which really, in my view, brings that home. I'll read it in English, uh, Persian and re re repeat the meaning in uh, English also, which says, which really means, all birds of paradise, bless me with resolve, and determination for the journey that I have set forth is far, and I have just begun and made the first steps. Again, thank you very much. And <laughs>